Welcome back to Black News Tonight. If there is one person about whom we've done maybe the most reporting at Black News Tonight, it is hands down Nicole Hannah-Jones. We've done in-depth interviews about her critically acclaimed 1619 project and on the tenure controversy at the University of North Carolina. See, a day goes by without somebody from the right attacking her. The most recent feud took place on Twitter when the conservative commentator Megyn Kelly, who is a vocal opponent of critical race theory, among other things, was jubilant on Twitter, celebrating another victory against the teaching of the theory. To this, Hannah Jones tweeted, I guess it's good you no longer pretend to be a journalist anymore. Be well. I love the be well. That's just the perfect way of getting rid of somebody. Megyn then tweeted in response, says the woman who quietly tried to cleanse her dishonest reporting without even having the spine to own her shameful errors. This is why scholars from the L and the R uh, have planned, planned your work as anti-historical and dangerous. It belongs nowhere near K-12 education. Ugh, the hate continues. Uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones fired back was saying, if only I'd done penetrating journalism like special report Santa is white. <laughs> Game, set, match. That ended the Twitter back and forth. Uh, and uh, anyway, let's move on because I want to get into the back and forth because it's ridiculous. And I got more interesting things to talk about with the incoming professor <laughs> of race and journalism at the Mecca, Howard University, Professor Nicole Hannah-Jones. Welcome <laughs> to Black News Tonight. Thank you, Professor. Uh, happy to be on with you. Talk to me about sort of, first of all, why, what do you make of the assaults on your, not just your work, but your character, your intelligence, your integrity? I mean, the right has been just beating up on you for months now. What do you make of it? Why, why now? Um, your guess is as good as mine because I've been writing about racial inequality for 20 years. I've spent the last you know, 10 years of my career writing about racial segregation and housing uh, through schools, that is uh, policy of the government. Um, but I think what was so unsettling about the 1619 Project was to have a project that became very popular, that really tried to unsettle disestablished narratives about American exceptionalism, uh, this idea that we were a nation founded on freedom, um, that's, that was really marking our origins, not with 1776 in the Declaration, but with 1619 and the introduction of African slavery into the colonies. Um, and so I think this has become clearly part of the culture wars and the 1619 Project is being used as a tool to stoke white resentment. And I am in the face of the project. I'm the black woman who got this project uh, published in the New York Times. Um, I, I, I don't think I'm the image of what someone expects a New York Times reporter to look like or or to uh, comport herself. So I think I've just become a target and, and a symbol in the culture wars. P big part of the culture wars these days is critical race theory. How do you feel about being lumped in with critical race theory? I've had so many debates on this show alone about people who can't even name uh, a critical race theorist, but when they try, they say your name. Uh, it seems like you're being lumped in with a, a broader nationwide war against teaching anything about race in, in public education. Uh, what do you, how, how do you make sense of that piece of it? Well, one, as we know, um, the fight against critical race theory is just a contrived uh, Republican propaganda campaign. And we need to call it what it is. The fact that we're all talking about critical race theory in education shows how successful this campaign has been. And so my project is, of course, being lumped in with that because uh, this is, again, um, an effort to really stoke resentment. It's, it's to use uh, kind of the, the, the tensions in a pluralistic society um, in order to pass a larger agenda, which I think we're seeing also with uh, the efforts to restrict the vote. So when people have decided that they're going to use critical race theory as a scare tactic to stoke resentment, they're not caring what critical race theory is. They're not trying to be factual with their arguments here. They're just trying to lump as many, quote unquote, scary things together as possible. The 1619 Project was clearly not critical race theory. It's a work of journalism that uses history to draw conclusions about uh, the, the present. But I have studied critical race theory as many uh, 
scholars of, of race in this country have. Um, and we know that it's not being taught in K-12, as you've demonstrated on your own show. Uh, no one's been able to produce a teacher, <laughs> right? A, a fifth grade teacher, an 11th grade teacher who's teaching critical race theory. It's just become a stand in for talking about race, talking about history, um, for truthful accounting of America. And uh, after we saw last year, with these global protests around uh, black rights with the first time in the history of the Black Lives Movement where a majority of white Americans were supporting the movement, where you started to see a significant number of white Americans saying, okay, maybe inequality is not just about individuals and their choices. Maybe there are larger systemic issues at play that we should address. It's not then incidental that that's when we start to see this massive pushback uh, against teaching about racism, teaching about structural inequality. And if you read these laws, it's very clear. The laws are not saying uh, we need to ensure an accurate accounting of history. What they're actually saying is we need to ensure that we're not teaching uh, the racial history of our country, because if we teach that, kids might take that to think that our country is racist, which is kind of uh, the giveaway right there. Your work, of course, is showing the racial history of America and the lingering impacts of uh, slavery on contemporary American society, among other things. Uh, what do you say to the people like Megyn Kelly who say that your work is anti, excuse me, that is anti-historical and dangerous? What do you say to that? Uh, I don't really have a response to someone like Megyn Kelly. Um, she's not actually worthy of me responding to, frankly. Fair enough. Um, when, when people talk about anti-CRT, they say that they don't want cancel culture, that, that people, those of you who are doing critical race theory, you crazy race theorists, you journalists, you historians, all you people, you're trying to cancel white people. Uh, but it's interesting because as these anti-CRT bills are passing in many states, someone like you is actually the one that's being canceled. You're the one who would, not, who would not be allowed on the curriculum. You're the one who would likely be banned from speaking engagements. Your work would be banned. Uh, my sense has always been that the right is the one doing the canceling here. How, how do you make sense of the, the cancel culture narrative that's also emerging? I mean, it's it's the height of hypocrisy, right? Because the same people who are arguing against cancel culture by private people, by private business, uh, are using the levers of the state. And this is what I think is very critical, right? This is not just, you know, a company saying we don't like this person's racial views, so we're not gonna hire them anymore. This is this is uh, politicians using the lever of the state to censure and ban materials that they disagree with. Um, they are trying to legislate against the work of American journalism, which is the 1619 Project. They're trying to outlaw certain words and concepts from being taught. Uh, as, as the writer uh, Tim Snyder said, these are memory laws. These are laws to control what we think uh, what ideas we can expose our children to in our understanding of this country. So it's, it's the height of hypocrisy. Um, anyone who's concerned about cancel culture and the First Amendment, whether you love or hate the 1619 Project, should be opposed to efforts by the government to prohibit and ban uh, speech and ideas that they don't like. And that's what we're seeing happening here. Um, these laws, you know, what what's, what's so interesting to me is if you actually study critical race theory, and this is how we know this is a, a fake controversy, if you actually study critical race theory, it's not about individuals at all. In fact, it's, it's trying to show the opposite, which is that whether or not individual white people are racist, we have a country where racism is embedded in the structures. And so the structures replicate inequality, whether you personally are racist or not. That's not about saying that individual white people are racist and white people are inherently racist. It's saying that we are a country where that is just a factual right, argument, where racism was embedded in the laws. That's just fact where racism was embedded in our politics, that's just fact. Where racism was embedded in our, embedded in our institutions, that's just fact. So I, I, again, the fact that we're even talking about it speaks to how successful this, this campaign has been. But I argue, you know, our, this past, the racism, uh, the anti-blackness, the legacy of slavery, that is just the facts of our history. They are shaping our country, they are shaping our political systems, our, our laws, our cultural institutions, uh, our social interactions, whether we acknowledge that past or not. 
But if we don't teach that past, we actually don't have an ability uh, to understand what's happening in our country and certainly to do something about what's happening in our country. And what they're really trying to do is control uh, how we conceive of ourselves as Americans um, and to really use uh, anti-critical race theory laws, anti-1619 project rhetoric to justify why they're passing these other laws that are trying to really proscribe the franchise and our basic rights. Absolutely. Nicole, stay with me. We got much more coming up uh, on Black News Tonight with Nicole Hannah-Jones. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Black News Tonight. I'm back with the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and the inaugural night chair in race and journalism at Howard University, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Nicole, you go by the Twitter handle Ida Bay Wells, which I think is so fresh. Um, talk to me about, about what Ida, Ida B. Wells means to you as a journalist and how her legacy influences you. Yeah, sure. So uh, Ida B. Wells is the template. She was the first black woman investigative reporter that I'd ever learned of. Uh, she was a woman who, uh, you know, was an innovator of intersectionality. She fought for civil rights. She was a co-founder of the uh, NAACP. She fought for women's rights, a feminist, a suffragist. She was one of the first women to hyphenate her name when she got married. And she was an investigative reporter who um, innovated investigative reporting techniques. She's considered uh, the mother of data reporting. Um, at the time when Ida B. Wells began her journalism career, there was no accounting for how many black people were being lynched in this country and no real investigations outside of the official white narrative that black people were being lynched uh, because they were raping women and uh, committing crimes. And she really began to investigate and uh, in the red record, to produce the first actual uh, data on the number of lynchings and the reasons why these lynchings were occurring. So for me, um, she, you know, this was a woman who spoke her mind, who uh, was often castigated in the press by the black press and the white press because she didn't stay in her place and who was the epitome of the type of journalist that I wanted to become. So I've long used her as a template. Uh, I've talked about Ida B. Wells for years. I found years I founded an organization, co-founded, I'm sorry, an organization in 2015 called the Ida B. Wells Society for Investigative Reporting, where we train and mentor uh, investigative reporters of color. Color. And um, I've just uh, been so glad to see that her name uh, has become, once again, part of the national lexicon, because like so many black women, uh, she's been written out of both the history of civil rights, the history of women's rights and the larger American story. But now she's she's uh, retaking her rightful place. As, as her name uh, moves back to the center of our public conversation, how about those methods? Do, do you see the kind of courageous, field-changing journalism in the mainstream, not just among black journalists, but across the board these days. Is, is media still capable of doing that kind of work? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we are seeing that type of work happening all the time. I mean, I think about the projects on policing by Kimbriel, uh, Kelly, and uh, Wes Lowry when they were both at the Washington Post. And similar, I mean, almost uh, very much um, comparable to what Ida B. Wells was doing, they also began to tabulate the number of black people who were being killed by police. We didn't have a real record of that either. So I still uh, certainly see a lot of data reporters, a lot of journalists who are doing that really muckraking reporting and holding power accountable uh, and, and in that tradition and the tradition of a lot of other investigative reporters. It's, it's alive and well, for sure. Uh, a little while ago, uh, New York Post resurfaced a Vox podcast that you did back in 2019 with Ezra Klein, where you were talking about Cuba and you said that Cuba had, quote, least, the least inequality between black and white people, largely due to socialism. Obviously, in the last week or so, we've seen protests in Cuba. Uh, what do you make of the statement you made then, and what do you make of what's going on now? So, one, that was a much, you know, as the right is prone to do, they, they took a very uh, small clip out of a much larger conversation. It was a conversation about uh, school integration and racial inequality. And Ezra Klein asked me, you know, is there any country that's, that's getting it right? And my context was, 
Well, it's hard to compare the United States to many other countries because uh, many of the European countries that have less inequality don't have racial diversity like we have. They don't have a history of chattel slavery. So you have to look to the Americas and countries that have a history of chattel slavery. And then many of those countries are heavily black. You know, most of the, the islands in the West Indies, there's not a large enough white population to talk about integration. So if you look in the context of uh, our hemisphere in the Americas, in countries that had a history of chattel slavery, um, and you look at certain indicators, uh, how integrated are the schools, what's the life expectancy gap between black and white people, um, things like universal health care, universal college, that of the multiracial countries in our hemisphere, Cuba has the least um, inequality in those areas. This was, and that is because of socialism, because the government controls all of those things. The government has said, if you need health care, you will, we will provide it. We don't have that in the United States. When the government controls every school that you go to, the government can decide that you will go to the same schools together because there's not an option for private schools. So this was a complex, nuanced conversation, and they took a single sound bite. And, and mind you, this was in 2019, which is prior to the protests that are happening right now. I think this just speaks to uh, the way that the right weaponizes sound bites out of context, um, that often this, these um, conservative media don't adhere to the same ethical standards of journalism, where you can't just, you know, the New York Times can't just take a quote out of context and write a whole article around it without providing that context, without contacting the journalist or, or the person who said that. Um, and it wasn't um, in any way uh, promoting Castro. It wasn't in any way promoting socialism. We have to just be able to have a factual conversation. I mean, this is just a fact. Cuban, black Cubans have a higher life expectancy than black Americans. That's just a fact. Um, so I guess, you know, I don't know how to have a conversation in a nuanced way um, when you always have to be afraid that someone is going to weaponize a single sentence in a much more a complex conversation and use it against you. But the other thing is, uh, of course, what no one is saying is that so much of uh, the economic problems that Cubans are suffering from have come from this decades-long blockade that the United States has had against Cuba. That is also just a fact. It's not a comfortable fact. It's not one that speaks, you know, in the American uh, narrative about freedom and democracy. But they have a hard time getting the goods and services that they want because we don't, our country does not allow those uh, goods to come into Cuba. We don't allow Cubans um, to send the types of remittances, remittances home that other uh, nation, other immigrants are allowed to send. So there's, it's a complex story. And, um, you know, I just got caught up in, I, I think that there are people now who are paid to go through every conversation I have, uh, every talk I've given, and try to find uh, something that they can uh, try to use against me. Uh, I'm not going to apologize for speaking facts. This, this was just a, a factual interpretation of, of what the data shows. Nicole, I only have 30 seconds, but what does what toll does that take on you personally? You know, now you've gone from <laughs> being a great journalist to a, a publicly celebrated great journalist uh, who's under attack. When you see these things, misrepresentations of your words, snippets, the the snooping, looking for you to make a mistake, how, what kind of toll does it take on you personally? Um, it's hard. I mean, I'm a human being, and I actually uh, take a great deal of pride in the work that I do. I I'm very careful. I work very hard on it. Um, my journalism really matters to me. Um, and so to become kind of this um, figure that is constantly villainized, constantly uh, misrepresented, where people try to not just uh, disparage my work, but disparage me as a, as a person. I mean, um, you know, I tweeted about this yesterday, the type of um, racist emails, sexist emails I get, people threatening my life, people threatening to burn down my mother's house because of how I'm portrayed in the media, um, in conservative media, it, it's taxing. It's 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 not easy. Um, some days are, I deal with it better than others, but I also strongly understand um, if I wasn't doing work that mattered, if the work that I was doing was not uh, unsettling uh, people who are used to holding power and controlling the narrative in this country, I wouldn't be facing the type of opposition that I have. And this is why I look to someone like Ida B. Wells. And I know, you know, she had it so much worse than I do. 
uh, I'm very blessed compared to what so many of our ancestors have been through. Uh, so I feel like they they have uh, fortified myself, and I know I know you probably feel the same way, right? They have fortified us to withstand whatever it is that comes our way. Amen. Nicole, thank you for your work. Thank you for your courage. And thank you for spending some time with us on Black News tonight. Thank you. All right. Let us know what you're thinking. Hit us up on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at BNC News. And be sure to visit the website, bnc.tv. And go to BNC News and subscribe to our channel.